All right. So today, I think I'm going to put in a new stereo system in the 61 Impala. Now, keep in mind, I'm not trying to boom the Windows off of things or anything like that. I just want some bass and some decent, you know, mid-range um, and highs coming out of this thing. Not super loud. I'm not that way. Um, well, I am sometimes. <laughs> Um, so this is what I'm going to be doing here. I'm going to be make, doing this very similar to the Chevelle. Um, so on the Chevelle, I have um, uh, kick panel speakers. Um, they're Alpine's SPR 60s, I think they are. Um, they're component speakers. So basically, um, there is a tweeter um, that's separated from the, um, the woofer. And I can direct the sound. And they're mounted on the kick panels. Um, the issue with the Chevelle and the Alpines that I chose here is that they, the magnet will hit the back of the wall. So you can buy spacers for the kick panels that will push the speaker out. Um, the only thing that I don't like is the speaker being pushed out too much, especially on the other side. Um, it interferes actually with the emergency brake. So... And then the crossover for these are hidden behind the speaker. There's a little bit of space behind the speaker um, underneath for the crossover. So that's where the crossover is. The other thing with this is I have the subwoofer under the seat. Um, it's too dark for me to really show you that. But um, the problem with having the subwoofer, this gives great sound. And on top of that, I have a, a retro sound radio. Um, it's a modern radio that looks vintage. Um, so the problem with the having the subwoofers under the seat is it sounds great. This system sounds great. I wanted to kind of do something similar with the Impala. The problem is if you're a passenger and you boost up the, <laughs> the bass, um, the subwoofer is under your butt, man, and um, you can feel it. And so it's not exactly the most comfortable feeling for, for the passenger. So I wanted to do a little bit different in the Impala. I didn't want to do the subwoofer under the seat. I'm putting the subwoofer in the back. So the cool thing is, I got a really jam and deal at Goodwill. I got, I, I fixed this up a little, I got new grills and everything, but I got a subwoofer box, two 10 inches Alpines um, and heavy ass box. The speakers are in great condition. And I also got a Kenwood thousand watt mono amp um, that has two channels. So it's perfect for the two speakers in the box. Um, I got both of these things for under a hundred bucks at Goodwill and they work. Um, so <laughs> I couldn't pass that up. So that is what the catalyst was for me, kind of putting the stereo into this thing. Right now, the stereo that's in it only uses the two stock speakers, the front dash and the rear. <laughs> and uh, it's a tinny sound. It's really not much to it. So I figure, well, this is the next, you know, the next evolution of the car here. Put a decent stereo in here. So I'm doing that. I got uh, Sundown Audio. Um, it's 100 watts per channel. Well, actually, yeah, it's about 100 watts per channel. I'm not going to put in rear speakers on this. I'm only going to do the front and the subwoofers. They sound great in the Chevelle that way. I didn't need rear speakers in the Chevelle. I'm going to do the same thing here, but I am going to run wire for the two rears if I, in case I want to tear up my, my rear shelf and put two 6x9s in the back, but I'm not going to do that initially. I don't think I'm going to need it for my sound taste. Um, I already ran wiring, and I'll show you that. Um, the interesting thing with the wiring that'll save you time is uh, this is nine conductor cable. So if you got pre outs or pre outs coming from your head unit, you got two conductors for the front right, two for the front left, two for the rear right, two for the rear left. That's eight. And then you have one for the remote signal to turn the amp on when you turn the car on. So it's a perfect nine wire system for the amps. And then I ran two pairs um, for the front two speakers on each side. Um, I ran them back to the front. That'll come from the amp to the front. So um, nine conductor cable is really cool and it's low level signal. So, you know, you don't need a high gauge or I mean a low gauge um, for your wiring for that. Here's the thing, a um, couple of things you need to know if you're doing a 61 Impala. I bought kick panels, I painted them red. The JBL club speakers work just fine with a stock opening, which is five inches. You just need to um, basically clip a little bit in for the screw 
uh, what you call it here, the, the screw clips, the eclipse, or the, the clips or the screws, whatever you want to call them. Anyways, you have to clip in a little bit because six and a half inch speakers, you're going to come out, you know, about six inches for your screw diameters, um, where your screw holes are. The magnet for the JBL club speakers don't go beyond five inches, so they fit in just fine. So if you want an inexpensive speaker for your Impala, the club speakers are like $70 for a pair. The problem is they're not component speakers. They only go up to 50 watts, but they're decent. But, you know, that's what you, you get what you pay for, right? If you want to go a budget route. I went a little bit different route with the Impala. So I got the uh, Morels. Um, the reason for them is one, they're component speakers. Um, so they got came to come with the crossover and the and the tweeters. And the nice thing is that they're slim. So the back of the magnet, unlike the the sixth, the JBL club speakers, the magnet will just barely touch the wall behind the um, kick panel. Um, so they will fit. These will certainly fit because you can see how you know uh, thin they are. The problem with these is these metal pieces here extend beyond five inches in diameter of the hole. So what I'm going to have to do is either make the entire hole um, a quarter inch more on all around in order to get me the, the extra half inch that I need. Um, or what I've done is I've marked off the speaker placement. I marked off where those metal pieces um, kind of interfere with this. So I'm just going to cut the quarter inch off of only these areas where those little metal um, pieces protrude. And that way I don't have to cut an entire, you know, quarter inch off the entire circle. Maybe that's just my laziness, but I just preferred that way. So let me give you some nuances with uh, some nuances with the M61 Impala. I'm going to, I cut out a rear shelf um, for the back. Here, I'm going to mount the shelf on the back. Um, on the 61 Impala, this piece here and this piece here um, protrude a little higher than the rest. So because of that, I made some standoffs, some wooden standoffs. Um, so I'm going to put the shelf on the standoffs. Um, the nice thing with those, and I'm only going to put the standoffs, I'm going to only screw them on each side and in the middle of the shelf, um, I'll screw the standoffs to the shelf itself, but I'm not going to screw it to the to the sheet metal. Here's the thing with the Impala, you got to keep in mind. And so the nice thing with the standoffs is it'll give me a little bit of air underneath the shelf. So I'm going to run all the wires underneath the shelf and then have them come up through the shelf to get to the amps rather than throwing wires above the shelf. So you'll see how that looks. The other is be careful when you're drilling holes because where these things are right here on this part, that's where the gas tank is. <laughs> so um, I use screws that just happen to be about a quarter, I, a quarter inch below the sheet metal, and I grind it off the points just in case <laughs> that it wouldn't really matter. But, um, but these will protrude about a quarter inch below the sheet metal. Um, there's about two inches of space between the gas tank and probably more, but about two inches of space between the gas tank and the top. So quarter inch is good, but be careful when you're drilling the back is what I'm trying to say because the gas tank is underneath that. So you want to be really careful about that. All right. Um, what else am I going to tell you here before we, you know, kind of get started? Um, the cabling, really cool, really easy. The sill, you just take the screws off, the sill just pops right out. Put the cable underneath the carpeting. There's a little channel that's right there actually that helps with that. So you don't even see the cable. This this bump that you see there isn't the cable. This actually is a channel that's there. So we're out the cable underneath. Um, and I tuck it just between the seat and this armrest here all the way down. I see some of it coming up there, but anyway. You can push it all the way down. On the Impalas, on the 61 Impalas, the back seat pops up and out. Really easy to take the back seat off if you really wanted to, which I did. I popped the back seat up and just pushed the wires through. 
this um, metal piece right here just slides right off as well. It's not held by anything. So really easy to route the wires on the 61 Impala to the back. Um, and then on the front, I'll show you what the kick panel piece looks like. So you saw the kick panel in the, in the, in the trunk. There's a lot of space back here. Um, the JBL club speakers will just barely touch this with the magnet, okay, the metal here. Um, so they will work. They work just fine. What some people do is they take out the vents and they put bigger speakers on the vent. And I can understand that, but I didn't, I want to still use the vents. So I didn't want to take the vents out. Um, the Morel speakers, like I said, it's a component system. So, you know, the speakers aren't going to hit the back. So I'll mount the speaker here. I'll put the tweeter up here and I'll hide the, um, crossover in this cubby area right here. Plus this cubby area also serves to hold a lot more wire. I don't like to stretch my wire to the exact lengths. I like to always have extra wire just in case. So it allows me to tuck a foot or two more of wire in here, um, excess wire. So, um, and then you can see the two speaker cables that come with the nine conductor um, cable here. So really easy. And then as far as routing the wire in the front, you just it's just wired just behind this area here. And there's the radio. Um, it's almost like a retro sound. It's a it's a prior pre retro sound radio, <laughs> so it didn't have Bluetooth. I, you, if you look at my playlist, you'll see how you can add Bluetooth as long as your radio has an auxiliary plug. If it doesn't have Bluetooth for like under ten bucks, um, if you need access to the radio, you just have to take the um, inside of the glove compartment out, which is easy to do. It's on my playlist. Um, so I was just, the last time I did that though, I had already routed the RCA plugs from the pre out pre outs on the radio, so. I don't have to do that. But if you need to replace the radio or have access to the radio, just um, take the glove box compartment plastic behind it out. Um, it's only four screws that hold it in. Okay, and like I said, there's on my playlist, um, putting you uh, Bluetooth in, you can see uh, how to do that. All right, so there we go. So let's get started on this. Uh, you got the crux of it. Um, all it is now is just wiring things up, putting RCA plugs on the cables and, and, uh, and just wiring things up. So I'll show you how I do that. And um, yeah, let's get going. All right, stay tuned. Okay, here we go. Quick update of where we're at. I covered the stage with felt. You can get felt really inexpensive at Joanna's Fabrics. I think like less than 10 bucks will give you a ton of felt. Um, make sure the particle board is clean and the felt is clean and then I used an adhesive spray on the felt and on the wood and laid the felt flat and just had about an inch of overlap on the bottom again with adhesive but I also followed that up with some staples um, on the bottom of this thing. I would show you but I already mounted this terminal block to it. Well let me see if I can get a little bit of it here. You can just see the bottom of that. Okay so I already have the terminal block here um, for the AccuWare system. Unfortunately, the the gauge wiring used isn't, I don't think, good enough, thick enough. I wish I would have used 4 or 4 AWG, 4 gauge, but I didn't. Um, so it, I think this is what came with the AccuWare system, actually. Um, but I don't think it's enough to draw. I, I, I Between the compressors with the AccuWare, with the air ride system being on, and the stereo, uh, I think that's going to be a lot of amperage coming through this thing. So what I'm thinking of doing is I will power the stereo system through this terminal block for now just to make sure everything works. But I think I'm going to add another battery. Um, I have plenty of room in the trunk here for another battery. So I'll buy two yellow tops. I want to buy them from the same lot so they're kind of like equal twins. And, um, you know, because you don't do that... Um, if you do two, two different batteries, um, one might draw from the alternator more than the other. And I don't know, there's some issues that you can run into in not having um, batteries from the same lot. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, basically, if I do that, I won't need this capacitor. Probably get flame for it anyways. The capacitors really, in my experience, don't do all that much good. It did in my last installation, help stop the dimming but of the lights when the subwoofer was on full blast. But the problem is that that car needed a more powerful alternator. If you have a powerful enough alternator and your car is spitting out 
a good amount of amperage, you don't need a capacitor. <laughs> and that's my opinion, but that's, you know, um, so I probably, if I add a second battery to this, probably won't need this. Um, so I may, I may put it on there since I already have it, at least give me the voltage output. <laughs> but that's really about it. Got my distribution block already. And um, yeah, so the next, uh, the next uh, clip here will just show you, um, I'll put the amps in and everything, start wiring everything up and show you how I wired it up. And that'll take you to the next stage. All right, stay tuned. Be right back. Okay, so I'm ready to put the kick panels in. Actually, I already put one in. This one's going to go in the exact same way as the other one. So that's what the other one looks like. There's a tweeter on the top, and then there's a mid-range. It fits really nice because they're slim. So do the same thing here. Um, the crossover. So what I'm going to do, so the crossover. So the tweeter um, outputs go here, the mid-range output goes here, and then the input from the amp comes in here in the middle. So what I think I'm going to do, well, I know what I'm going to do because I did it on the other side already, is I'm going to stuff the crossover in here. Just going to put a little foam to keep it snug. No screwing needed. Um, this is a pretty in easy install for the front um, kick panels here because the front kick panels basically um, just slide in. Um, they kind of snap in. So there's nothing to screw in or unscrew or anything like that. The... Uh, the speakers are nice and slim, <laughs> so an easy thing to get installed. Um, the only thing I didn't like about these speakers here, um, the Morrell speakers, is they didn't give you enough connectors. So I had to use some of my own connectors. Um, so you would think for something this expensive, they would supply you ample number of connectors, but they didn't. So anyways, all right, so let me show you this. After I get it in, actually, I'm going to see if I can show you the uh, the crossover once I get that put in, and then uh, and then we'll take it from there. All right, so stay tuned. All right, so let me show you what I've done here. Basically, I've put the crossover inside that little area there. I put a piece of foam behind it. It's sitting in there, really nice and snug. I'm going to put a small piece of foam in front of it also. Um, even though the speaker is a really slim speaker, it's not going to even come close to touching it. Um, nonetheless, I'm going to do that just in case. So let me put the kick panel back in. And uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. All right, stay tuned. Okay, so got the kick panel back in. Um, speaker grill just barely clears the parking brake, so that's good. Tweeters in place, and same with the other side. So I think at this point we're ready to maybe test this thing out and see what we've got. All right, so stay tuned. Okay, so I'm sitting in the trunk of my car. You can put bodies in this 61 Impala. <laughs> That's how they used to make them. So I have my system pretty much done. I didn't want to bore you with me stripping wires and crimping ferrules and stuff like that. I think you could figure that stuff out. But let me show you what I've done here. This isn't rocket science, putting stereos in your cars. I mean, it's it, it, if you take your time, study some YouTube videos and look at some installations, you'll see they're basically all and will follow the same fundamentals. You got amplifiers that drive speakers. Well, you have a radio that puts an output, you got amplifiers that drive speakers, and then you just wire it up. So this is how I wired this up. So first of all, I have two 10 inch subs here. So I have a mono, a two channel mono amp. Um, you don't need a two channel mono amp to drive your speakers your two speakers you can hook them up in parallel you can even hook them up in series but that's a different story so in this case you also don't need two speakers you can have a mono amp and you can either run one channel or you can bridge these things if your speaker can support the high amperage or i mean wattage and um and do that but in my case for what i did is i have a two channel mono amp 
and how it's wired up you can see the fuse on the left so there's the plus coming in that comes that goes to, from a distribution block which i'll show you in a minute the minus which is the ground uh, usually goes to your chassis or in my case the distribution block as well because it handles the ground and then this third wire is where the remote control for turning the amplifier on and that's usually your accessory wire so if you look at your radio now your radio when the car is off the radio turns off right if your car is an accessory motor you turn your car on you can turn your radio on so it probably has an accessory wire coming to it so either go to the fuse box or find the accessory wire and tap into it from your radio and that's what will turn the amp on and off if you don't have this and you don't do this your amp will be on all the time and it'll drain your battery so that's not good right then you have your speaker outputs so i have um i'm using both channels one for each speaker my subs and then you have some settings here uh so the first one is how much bass i want to pump out the second one is at what frequency i don't want bass playing across every all the if, if you have let's say you're playing classical music all of a sudden you know it doesn't have a lot of low frequencies you don't want your bass interrupting all the high, all the crisp high notes, right? So that's what this does. It cuts off. It's your cutoff frequency. So I usually, um, I usually go give me anything below 80 or 90 hertz. And so 90 hertz is about the highest I'll go to get, you know, some booming bass. And that's just my preference. Okay, you set this to your preference. That's why you have variable variables here that you can control. Then the third one is how much, it says input sensitivity, but it really is how much volume your speakers are going to be putting out. Everybody cranks this up. That's just kind of a natural state, but one, be careful with that. You could blow out your speakers if you're not, if they can't handle the wattage. And then I don't usually max it out anyways. So that's because I don't have a huge desire for a ton of bass. I just want bass when it's needed as part of the music I'm listening to but not to overwhelm, not to show off on the street or anything like that. And then, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. I'm not judging. Um, a lot of folks have some pretty killer um, bass coming out of their car. It's amazing. So, and then I have the inputs. So I, I'm not running um, a rear, rear speakers here. I don't, didn't really think I need them, but you never know. But what I have here is I have the rear front, rear left coming in here. But this shares the rear front, rear left with the other speakers if I had them hooked up. So there's also an output. So the first two here are coming from the radio, rear right, rear left. And then the second is um, output that's taking that rear right, rear left, and I'm feeding it back into this other amplifier. Because if I had rear speakers, I want them driven, right? So if you didn't have an amp that has um, input and output for your low level lines, um, then you're gonna need these, okay? It's a splitter. So what this does is you would basically have your front right and then your front left, and then one of these splits it up, this splits it up, and then one of these will go to one amp, and one of these will go to the other amp. So your amps are sharing the same signal. And this, these Y aren't needed because the SAMP already has the ability to share that signal already. So that's what those two plugs are. Okay, so there's that. Now, I have this four-channel amp. This is driving my subwoofers. This four-channel amp is driving my front mid-range and tweeters that you saw in the front that I put in. Now I have, here's my right, in, right and left inputs for the front and rear. Again, I'm not using the rear, um, but I hooked it up anyways, because you never know, later I might change my mind later on. So that's why you only see two pairs of speaker wires coming out of here. Um, one goes to the left and one goes to the right speakers in the front. And I should say they go to the front and right crossovers. And that's important because the, you saw in my previous, earlier, I have a crossover there that splits a signal into the highs and, and, and mids. So this here, I have this set to flat because I don't wanna use the crossovers on the amp. See, the amp has crossovers too. You can set your limits for your highs and your lows on the amp for both the front speakers and the rear speakers. But since I have passive crossovers in the front, I don't need to use the amp's crossover. So I set it to flat, so it just, cross, so it just uh, basically turns off the amp's crossover. 
but you might want, if you don't have component speakers with crossovers in the front, you might want to set this to highs or lows and, and set your frequencies at which they kick in or cut off. So I originally had this set to flat, meaning ignore the mixer or ignore the uh, crossover on the amp. Um, so it didn't matter what the settings for um, low and high were on the amp. I did that because my the Morels have a frequency response of 50 hertz to 22 kilohertz, meaning that uh, the crossover and the front speakers would have ignored anything below uh, 50 hertz. But the issue that I have is that I don't want I, I don't want anything below 90 hertz going really to the front. I want only the subs to handle that. So what I ended up doing, and it gave me a cleaner sound, of course, um, is I changed this to where the crossover in the fronts are passive crossovers. They still work, um, but I changed this to high pass. So there are two settings. There's HP, flat, and LP. If you put it on flat, it ignores the crossovers on the amp here. If you set it to LP, it means that any frequencies below the one the filter is set at um, is going to pass through. So, for example, a subwoofer with a low pass filter set at um, 50 hertz will only play frequencies below 50 hertz. So, the HP, the high pass setting, is this is the exact opposite. Okay, only frequencies above the one where the filter is set at will pass. So, a tweeter with a filter set at, say, 2 kilohertz will only play frequencies above 2 kilohertz. So, what I've done here is the crossover in the front are going to handle the mid-range and the high. I just wanted to filter out anything below 90 hertz um, on the bass. So I set this to high pass, and I set it to around, you know, to, to push every, every, everything for the tweeters, um, for, the, for the highs. And I set it to only allow 90 hertz and above, around 90 hertz and above, because this doesn't really have real accurate... Uh, numerical settings on it, but I approximated that 90 hertz and above is the only thing that's going to pass to the front speakers. So this way, the front speakers, um, if I didn't have it that way, anything between anything below 90 hertz would have hit the front mid range, and they st and if you raise the volume up really high, bass on the mid range is going to start making your speaker crackle, um, and that's not that's not good. You don't want to pound your, your mid-range with a lot of bass. That's what your subwoofers are for. So that's what I did there is basically set the amplifier so it only pushes 90 hertz and above to the front speakers. And then the crossover on the front speakers will take care of uh, pushing um, the right frequencies to the tweeters and the mid-range speakers up front. All right. So I wanted to clarify how that works and why I did that. It's a clean sound much cleaner. You don't get any crackling on the speakers from heavy bass hitting the mid-range. And yeah, and so hopefully it explained what the high pass and low pass filter settings do here. All right. So let's get down to it later. And then you have your level, which is how much volume you're pumping out. And I don't pump, I don't max this out either. You can mess up your speakers if they can't handle the wattage. Um, but for the volume that I have, I have pretty good volume. I really don't need to set this gain up very high. It's the beauty of these stereo systems that um, you don't have to follow, uh, you know, someone's guidebook per se. I mean, you can follow their guidebook. You don't have to follow their settings per se. You can set your own and experiment. You're not going to, unless you have speakers that can't handle the wattage coming out of your amps, you're not going to ruin your speakers, you know, by playing with the settings. So play with them. And um, catch some YouTube videos and you'll see the differences in how some of the people use some of these adjustments. Anyways, the power for this is the same as this, has a negative and positive and a remote, um, but it's on the back of the unit. But it's the same thing as this. So I'm sharing the pluses, I'm sharing the ground, and I'm sharing the remote wire. So what I have here, well, and then what I have here, these are the uh, radio outputs. Front right, front left, rear right, rear left, and you can see they go to the inputs on the amp. Okay? And then I have a distribution block. This is what's feeding the amps their power. 
So I have, I don't drive a whole lot of, I don't have these amps maxed out or anything. So I'm fine using eight AWG, eight gauge wire, but most people prefer four. And I can see that because these amps can draw a lot of power if you're going to be, you know, really hitting them hard. So um, the distribution block has uh, fuses on them already. So on the very top, you can see there's a four gauge wire coming in on the top for plus, you know, that's the positive of your battery. Um, and they go to the top of the fuses and then through the fuses and they feed the amps. The bottom wire is actually ground and it goes to the chassis of the car and then that's the negative for the amps those two wires coming out of there um, that's ground for the amps now these two plus and minus are hooked into a separate distribution block because that distribution block does a couple of things for me one it's it was already i already put it there because i have an air ride system in here so that's one it was already there so i tapped into that not just to draw power to the distribution block here. Really what I did with that is I brought that, went through a fuse, this is my power coming, basically that comes from the alternator, okay? So it goes through the fuse and I installed a second battery in here. And so that red wire coming from the front is the alternator that's going to be charging this battery when the car is on. And then you can see the plus and minus for this battery are coming back this way the plus is to the chassis and then or the negative is to the chassis and then the negative there beats the distribution block so there's a lot of different ways some people put what's called um, an isolator switch a, a switch here from the battery um, that shuts off that disconnects this battery from the front battery basically so when your car is off and you're running tunes you're draining a battery and you're only draining this one in the back and you're leaving the front battery intact so that way you can start your car so if you drain your battery you don't drain both batteries you've only drained the one in the rear and you can still start your car i've never had to install one of those i don't sit there for hours driving my music um, when the car is off I, and these two batteries are agm batteries they're really good batteries and i've never had the need for that so i mean the best the most i might do is maybe install a cutoff switch but even then i put quick disconnects on the batteries i don't even really need a cutoff switch even so uh i, I you could have a and yeah this cutoff switch is for the rear but i also have one in the front so i can always cut off the front battery i can always cut off the rear battery um i don't need one of those um those isolator switches i've never needed them but it's not to say that they're not useful so don't get me wrong um, this is for my purposes. I'm a low level player here when it comes to these things. So um, I don't need a whole lot. Also, you can see I didn't install the capacitor. <laughs> I opted just to go with the second battery. Um, a capacitor, I'll tell you my, uh, my opinion is they really don't give you much value. If you need a capacitor because your lights are dimming when you're totally hitting the base hot, hard, um, that, that means your amps drawing some, a lot of power but that means your battery is weak or your alternator isn't that powerful so get a more powerful alternator or get a bigger battery put a second battery in um, and that will probably solve your problem um, the capacitor is only good for a one-shot deal you know you're going to get that little push of power you know that it's some need so it doesn't clip or maybe so your lights don't dim but as soon as that capacitor discharges i mean it's going to struggle to stay charged up if you're constantly hitting your base so I, I never saw value in the capacitors i put one in my previous car because it did help because i did have a, a weak alternator and it did help but the lights didn't dim anymore but you know what uh, replace the alternator <laughs> That's, i kept saying to myself replace the alternator i just never had time all right so there you have it um let me end this video by playing you some tunes from the car. Like I say, live for today. Enjoy life. Life is short. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. All right. Peace out. All right. Let's try cake.